Okay, shall we begin? Are we okay to begin? Okay, welcome everyone to the <coughs> first seminar of the Contemporary Marxist Research Group. Actually, it's London-based, I was going to say based at King's, but it is a, a trans-London, transnational institution now. And someone once said that we were the best educational experience in Europe, if not the world. So welcome to the best experience you're probably ever going to get. Um, we have a wonderful seminar today. My name is John Narayan. I have partly helped run the seminar with other more kind of able people. Um, and what we're going to do today is have a seminar on what we've called a second pink tide prospects and challenges for the Latin American left. As you may have been paying attention, as Europe itself pivots towards the far right and fascism, for those of us on the left, it's kind of more enamoring is what's happening in Latin America with bits of the left seizing control of various states across the continent. But that, in a sense, is also a path of trepidation as neoliberalism globally goes into crisis and movements within Latin America seem not to have progressed in the way that we thought we had. So we are all kind of quite worried about the runoff that is going to happen in Brazil, or as we'll find out about Chile's rejection of the rejection of a of a, what is essentially a neoliberal constitution. Um, and so we, we brought everyone together, we put together a great panel today to kind of reflect on that, but also I hope inspire us um, and give us a ray of sunshine on the left, if, if, if not anything else. So what we're going to do is have four 10 minute or 12 minute interventions, and then we will have as normal, our questions and answers from our wonderful audience who come from across the globe. So if I introduce each speaker as we go along. So first up, we have Mariano Feliz, who is a professor, uh, a professor in Argentina uh, and an active researcher. He's a fellow of the International Research Group on Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies, uh, and also linked to the Rosa Luxemburg Institute. So. Mariano, it, the floor is yours if you unmute yourself. Thank you, John. Thank you for the, the invitation to participate. I would like to, well, to begin with uh, a, a few comments on, on the situation in Argentina. Uh, as you might know, uh, Argentina is, is in, a, in a very big economic and political crisis. I think we can say that for the last 10 years, the country has not grown. We are in the process of stagnation with high inflation and growing inflation. This year, inflation is going to top about 100% in the whole year. Um, this is not a question of, of the global, just of the global crisis, but the process deep within Argentina's economy. I think <clears throat> this crisis began of course, as in many other countries in 2008 with the global crisis, but it accelerated after, in political terms, after in 2013, uh, Hugo Chavez died. So the whole continent, the whole continent of South America went into a political crisis, I think, and, and this has accelerated the process here. In late 2015, uh, a new conservative government led by Mauricio Macri, uh, a businessman, uh, began, which as a, as a consequence, we had like an increasing amount of, of debt, first with private capitals. And in 2018, as the crisis grew larger, uh, we went back into the arms of the IMF. Um, and luckily enough, in 2019, at the end of the year, uh, this government went bankrupt. Uh, they lost the election. But, uh, and, and this is the connection with what we are going to be discussing here, there was the election of a new uh, Peronist government, if you call, if you know, Peronism is a, a, what's called here a national popular movement born in the 1940s. There's a lot of debate of, of it, uh, about its nature. But it has, it pretends to be part of this second uh, tide, this second wave of the pink tide in the region. Um, it's important to notice that this, got this new government, led by Al Alberto Fernandez, won the election, but the, the conservative uh, alliance, led by Macri, 
uh, also got 41 percent of the votes in the second round. In, in a way, we can say that this is similar to what's happening or will happen uh, in, in Brazil in the next few weeks. Um, the question here is that this, govern, this new government, the government of the Presidente de Todos, the front of everyone, that was the, the name of the alliance led by the Peronist uh, movement, uh, included uh, as the vice president, Cristina Fernandez. She was the president of Argentina in the first wave of these, this uh, so-called pink tide or red tide or whatever. In, in, in Argentina, she, she was president between 2007 uh, and 2015 for two terms. Um, this new government uh, came into power with the slogan that they were going to restart the economy. The, an economy, as I said, was stagnated and uh, with high inflation. And to begin by helping the, the last ones in the, in the pyramid, no? in the social pyramid. Um, a few months after this happened, if they won, uh, well, we had the pandemic then, this year we had the, the, the war in, in Europe and uh, all of this combined, uh, the secular stagnation of Argentina's economy, plus the pandemic, plus the war, plus some limitations, I think, uh, by this new Peronist government led to a process where in this year we have much higher inflation than the, the last five, point, uh, five, six years. In, 19, in 2015, inflation was around 40%. As I said, nowadays we are running into 100% a year inflation. And wages are still going down. They have been going down for like five, six years. That is, for the whole of this new government, the federalist government, national popular, left-wing government, if, we, if you will. Um, that's a, a problem uh, of... Um, increasingly an increasing number of working poor. There's a lot of job creation, but most of the people that are getting a new job are still poor, even if they work. So we have a problem with the, the, the salaries, the wages that are being paid here in, in, in the country. And besides, as I said, in 2018, um, Macri's government got us in, back into the IMF, uh, uh, the International Monetary Fund's arms, but uh, the Peronist government negotiate, renegotiated this uh, debt in this, during the last year and this year. And we are now again within a, the, uh, an austerity program led by the IMF. I think this, this question, the question of, of austerity in the midst of this uh, economic and political and social crisis, I think is part of the uh, hegemonic consensus here in Argentina between the both sides of the political spectrum, the, this conservative alliance led by Macri and the national popular pop, uh, Peronist uh, alliance led by uh, Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner nowadays. And to this consensus, the, the consensus is the need to get uh, to foster austerity to recover economic growth in the long term. And to this consensus, I think we might have, we have to add the consensus around uh, the need to um, promote extractivism, new, a new form of extractivism in, in the country. A new form of extractivism led by uh, exports that will help, that should help the North to transition uh, into a new energy matrix. matrix. We have new projects and, uh, around the shale gas, in a deposit of shale gas and oil in the south of the country called Baca Muerta, the cow. We also have uh, deposits of, of lithium in the northern part of the country together with uh, Bolivia and Chile. And this is also, there are very big projects there to extract lithium for exports uh, led by transnational corporations in general terms, uh, German corporations, Chinese corporations. We also have a green uh, hydrogen project in the south of the country and of course, the traditional uh, soya beam uh, exports that are most of uh, our uh, agricultural exports. All of this is part of this new wave of extractivist uh, policies that the current uh, Peronist government is pushing forward in a, with, a, with a developmentalist argument with 
but uh, at the same time, these um, these projects, the, the 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 project of the conservative alliances too. It's, there's no debate there on what to do in, in, in general terms. So the question here to me um, and that many social movements are having at, at this time here in, in Argentina is whether this is uh, a popular government as they, as they call themselves, they call themselves national popular or a left-wing government. This is a really tough question or not so tough, I guess, since they are pushing forward with a, a project of a, a program of austerity that will reduce fiscal deficit, that is cutting down uh, public expenditures, um, that is promoting extractivism, as I said. And it's also promoting the repression of uh, resistances. Just uh, yesterday, there was a, an important repression uh, by the police forces, the national police forces, of Mapuchean communities in the southern part of the country, Mapuchean communities that are uh, that were taking a plot of land for, for living. Um, and well, the, the, the police forces of the national government went there to expel them from, these, from those places. And a couple of years back, we also have a very big um, repression of uh, the taking of a plot of land by about 3,000 families in in the greater area of Buenos Aires, and they were expelled also by the police forces. So there's the, there's the, 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 real, the actual situation and the actual policies by this so-called uh, popular government. I, I think the question here is um, in what way we can see that this government uh, can be called part of this uh, pink tide, new pink tide, and what a, such a government should do in this context. The question I think, and we have, I think this is part of what we should be discussing is whether being moderated, uh, being uh, signing treaties with the IMF and fostering austerity is the way to go, or whether they should uh, radicalize the, their strategy in terms of in, in great, uh, in moving further to the, to the left, which is something that it's not happening. And just to wrap up, I think there, there are a couple of questions that are important too. On the, on the one hand, uh, we have uh, the, this new government has fractured social movements. The, the social movements that were born in general from the 2001 crisis, the Piquetero movement was fractured in, in I, you can say in two parts. Some of these movements are part of the government now, not, not just um, part of the alliance, governing the country, the national government, but also they have places in the in different areas of the government that they, they, they can manage, they can use resources from the state. Um, the, the, the discourse is that they have to do so, they have to be part of this alliance to uh, put a stop to the right-wing government, the possibility of a new right-wing government. So the question here is, what is a right-wing government, a, a government that follows austerity policies that represses uh, resistances, that signs treaties with the IMF, that uh, proposes extractivism as a development path. If that's a right-wing government, the current government is doing the same thing. And of course, there are many other movements, social movements are outside uh, of, the, of the governing alliance. Many political parties here in Argentina, the, the Trotskyism is, uh, is one of the main um, political parties in, in the country. They have representatives in, 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 the, in Congress. So th there, there is a, an articulation of political forces to the left of the government trying to stop this, this program. And at the same time, on the other hand, we also have the, the advancement uh, this, in, this, in a similar way as in Europe or the United States, uh, the advancement of the so-called extreme right movements, which is, I think, something that we should discuss, here, at least here in Argentina, if this, uh, this advancement is, is something real in terms of the political possibilities that they have to become part of the government, at least in, in our country. Or if just if they are just a, a sort of a square crowd that favors the austerity, austerity measures being put forth by this so-called uh, national popular government, I think 
this is something that should be discussed. Of course, these new extreme right movements are not something unimportant, I, I should say. They, they, there are some people that have tried a couple of weeks back, a month ago, uh, more or less, that, and that with this, within this discourse, they had tried to assassinate the vice president. And this is not something that we shouldn't worry about. But I think that there, there is a discuss, there has to be a discussion around what's, what is the program, what's the program of a, a new left should be, uh, and whether what the Peronist government is doing right now is in fact such a, such a program. And, and what the consequences are going to be in 2023 when we have again uh, presidential elections and the and right now the possibility of uh, the conservative government coming back into power are very real. So we, we are like in in a, in a very tough situation, I would say. Uh, this is something. This is all I want to say right now. I think uh, we're going to have uh, lots of elements to to discuss. Thank you. Brilliant, Mariano. Thank you very much, and for being on time. Um, can I just say in the chat, can we put the questions in the chat rather than the document? Because the chat makes it easier for everyone to see the questions and also uh, for, for, for those of us to read the questions out. So it would just be better to use the chat. Um, thank you, Mariano. Um, next up, we have Catalia, Catalina Montilla, who's a senior lecturer in international relations and the director of the MA in international relations and director of the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Center for War and Peace Studies at Liverpool Hope University. Her current research focuses on public diplomacy and peace building in Colombia. I'll just pin the spotlight on you, Catalina, because you should have the spotlight and it's all yours. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna talk about the prospects and challenges for the left in Colombia. And what I'll do is I'll uh, outline the conflict and socioeconomic background. Then I'll move to discuss a little bit the civil society role. I'll draw some parallels between the plebiscite in 2016 uh, in support of the peace process and the presidential elections of 2022. And finally, I'll talk about the challenges for the new administrations. So the Colombian conflict is the longest conflict in the Western Hemisphere. It involves the state, left-wing guerrillas, successful groups of right-wing paramilitaries, drug traffickers, and organized criminal groups. It has happened mainly in the countryside in response to the drive for appropriation of land and resources and the limitation of democracy. And that has, uh, as a consequence, we've had uh, gross human rights violations. It has been fueled by illicit economies, development projects, and extractivism. The government has spent between three and four percent of its GDP, uh, of its budget between 2000 and 2016 in the war, and this is a conflict that has resulted in about 220,000 deaths and 7.7 .7 million uh, internally displaced population by the time the peace process is signed. Now, in terms of victims, the official registers count nine million. 330,000 uh, uh, give or take victims in total by 2022, with a sharp decrease in that number between 2016 and 2020 uh, of less than a million. However, violence has increased in remote uh, rural areas since 2016, according to uh, figures provided by the World Bank in 2022. In socioeconomic terms, the integration of population has been very precarious. So you have a country, and I'm taking it from World Bank figures, poverty rates are much higher among indigenous populations, so 58% in Afro-Colombians, about 45%. Extreme poverty rates are higher, so more than 20% in the Pacific and the Caribbean regions, which are the ones that host, tend to host precisely these ethnic populations. 41.3% of the population is self-employed without any access to benefits, and half of Colombian people earn less than the minimum wages. Gini coefficient for Colombia is 0.52%, with an income poverty higher than the national average in rural areas. Colombia is also among the lowest levels of social mobility in the world, and has a high persistence of income across 
generations. Migrant population grew tenfold between 2015 and 2021. So we have about 1.8 million Venezuelans uh, looking for refuge in Colombia. And Colombia has lost 4.6 million hectares of forest since 2001, with a very sharp rise since 2015. And that, of course, bringing with it more disease, poverty, and lack of water. However, civil society has been very active in mobilizing to end the armed conflict. So between 2012 and 2016, during Juan Manuel Santos administrations, there were proposals by civil society organizations and grassroots sent to the table. There were victims delegations coming to the negotiation table in Havana, contributing to discussions on transitional justice reparations. And of course, you have high participation of populations on the plebiscite to uh, agree, support or not support the agreements in 2016. Civil society also contributes just me or is that for everyone else yes. and i'm taking this from political inclusion and the drawing of a new constitution which effectively in 1991 uh, provided a framework for the mobilization of about five guerrilla groups in 1990s uh, civil society uh, mobilized for the right to peace under Article 22 of the 1991 Constitution, and that generated a movement called the Citizen Mandate for Peace, which effectively defined the elections of uh, 1998, but also the subsequent peace process at the end of the 90s. And then in the first decade, by the, by the first uh, decade of the 21st century, civil society has accumulated 30 years of experience in terms of the strategies of education, political participation, organization, alliances, protests, and non-violent civil resistance. And you have very important organizations in Colombia like Red de Paz, National Coalition Conciliation Commission, the Peaceful Route for Women, and the Permanent Assembly for Civil Society, generating again that social infrastructure for peace. However, civil resistance campaign also halted the process. So peace agreement was not ratified in October 2016 uh, with a plebiscite that rejected the peace accords with 50.2% of the votes. It was mobilized from above. So right-wing party, Democratic Center, the Conservative Party, evangelical leaders, Christian leaders and politicians, rural landowners and the private sector campaign through regional media outlets, social media, and fought a, a, what they call a civil resistance campaign in the streets against impunity, the gender ideology that the, the agreement uh, embodied, and, uh, and taking from people to award <laughs> perpetrators of crime. That was, that was the campaign. Uh, so government was forced to revise the peace agreement, paving the way for the electoral triumph of Ivan Duque. Now, Interestingly enough, the no vote won in areas of low employment and the Democratic Center strongholds in elections of 2014. And the yes, and this is the Andean area of the country, and the yes vote was won in areas with the highest number of victims and the racial periphery. So the Caribbean coast, the Pacific lowlands, and the Amazon uh, regions. Civil society, however, after the plebiscite, mobilized about 25,000 people, mainly young people, and occupied the central square of Bogota after the rejection of the accords to support the accords and to force the government to you know, <laughs> sign and implement. What happens between 2018 and 2022 is that while the government is paying lip service to the accords mainly, opposing key components of it, over 400 human rights defenders have been killed in Colombia. This becomes the country with the highest level of environmental activists killed worldwide, and more than 235 ex-combatants killed, uh, according to NGOs uh, within Colombia. Now, NGOs and coalitions, however, uh, reported on assassinations of human rights defenders uh, by different groups and also established links with international community. There was huge social unrest since 2019, which peaked in 2021, with 7 million strong people during the pandemic, 
um, fostering national strikes and waves of protests. And these reflected the frustration with the government, the economic deterioration of the country, the lacked implementation of the peace agreement, the killing of activists, and this was met with heavy handed response. Uh, Duque reached the lowest level of approval rating for any Colombian president since measurement started by Gallup in 1994 in May 2021 with 80% of approval ratings. So this kind of mobilizes a change effectively in public opinion that leads the ex guerrilla Mevmer and politician Gustavo Petro to be elected president and a black woman and victims activist, Francia Marquez, to become the vice president. They actually attended the Truth Commission final report in June 2022, while the outgoing president, Ivan Duque, didn't. This is a president that had a big contingent of young voters and underprivileged urban centers, except, of course, Medellin. Now, if you compare the map, and this is a parallel I would like to draw, between the vote for the plebiscite, those who voted no for peace, and those who voted for the other candidate than Petro, you will find that they are in the Andean area, whereas is the right racial periphery, so the Caribbean coast, the Pacific lowlands, um, the, the Amazon and Bogota, the ones that are voting yes to the peace agreement and implementation, but also they're the ones who are voting for Petro, okay? Now, the, the plebiscite in 2016 was lost with 50.2% 50, 50 of the votes, whereas Petro wins with 50.4% of the votes in these elections. And this was an election that mobilized young and disadvantaged voters, a coalition of life wing parties, civil society organizations, politicians within traditional parties, uh, on the highest turnout in, in the last 50 years. This is an 11.3 million votes on a turnout of 58%. And, um, and, and, and so it looks like an incredible really happening in Colombian politics. I'm gonna end with some challenges for this incoming government because it's very early to say, you know, what's, what's gonna happen. Challenge number one is to enhance the political credibility of the left after the peace process actually managed to separate left-wing alternatives in Colombia from guerrillas, but the, the left still needs to enhance this as a presidential national option at regional levels. Uh, Bogota understands this, but regions still don't understand the left and guerrillas. Uh, the left is a political option, an administration option. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is to balance political forces in Congress because the historic pact that, that took um, Petro to the, the, the presidency is, is promoting very radical reforms uh, that might have to be watered down in function of the coalition, affecting, of course, the credibility with grassroots base and social sectors that are in, 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 a, in a more left-wing and, and sort of radical uh, uh, view of uh, transformations for the country. So there is a, a, a fragile majority in Congress. Challenge number three is that right-wing parties are active again via social media and civil resistance campaigns in Colombian cities against Petro, in Bogota, in Medellin, in Cali, uh, with exactly the same strategies that they use in the plebiscite, uh, at the same time as being in dialogue with the government. Uh, and here there is a pro-business agenda and against tax and health uh, reforms mainly. Challenge number four, is the implementation of the peace deal, what the government calls the total peace, is clashing against increasing violence and reaccommodation of organized armed groups. They are basically demonstrating a strategic strength for future negotiations, but also occupying the spaces that were left by FARC. So this kind of is, is shown then in land occupations in different regions and in a land reform that has had the slowest implementation and is at the core of the war and with increasing reports, again, as I said, not only of rural violence, but also of urban criminality. Challenge number five is environmental. So there is a potential opening with the Biden administration, but it might entail rene renegotiating the free trade agreement uh, with taxing the 4,000 wealthiest Colombians and find, of course, new sources of revenue. And Colombia, bear in mind, is highly dependent on coal, on oil, and on mineral extraction for more than half of its exports. 
Uh, challenge number six is balance security reform against human security and drug trafficking uh, challenges. So the United States uh, prefers the route of extradition and forced eradication, and that has been the preferred route traditionally. And 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 so the new government is gonna you know have a hard time selling a different type of policy. Challenge number seven, and is the last one, is a socioeconomic agenda in an strained economy. There is a depreciation of the Colombian peso. It fell 3% in June. The stock exchange fell 4%. So that, of course, entails investment confidence. Uh, we have a world debt crisis at the moment with more than 40 countries in debt, in, in, you know, uh, risking um, uh, falling or, or, or being in default. Uh, we have about 1.6 million Colombians that fell out of the middle class during the pandemic. And, and, and this big project very quickly can alienate private sectors, but in mind Colombia is ruled by oligopolies, which have links to political and media classes, uh, but also alienate middle and upper middle classes if they don't see a quick change in their economic prospects and situations. That's me, thank you. Thank you, Catalina, thank you very much. Okay, let me just move the pin. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Catalina. Our next speaker is Riesa Rouse, and she's an Afro-Brazilian researcher and human rights lawyer, mother and lecturer. Uh, she has been working at the intersections of law, race, and gender studies and Marxist political economy. And the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. So, um... Yeah, I think to start and address, directly address the question whether we are living a new pink tide or not, uh, I would say like that I think it's better not to put in those terms in order to avoid possible errors in the analysis of the present conjuncture. And uh, I think I, my intervention here will uh, talk a little bit about this in a Brazilian perspective. Uh, those errors or mistakes uh, can hide very, very important dimensions of the social reality in the days we live in. And um, I think that there's no doubt that we have clear main political and economic differences between the beginning of the century and the contemporary moment regarding uh, this progressive cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, many of them were already mentioned here. So... Um, first, that now we have a political instability in the region, and not only the, the re-emergency, but the greater organization of the extreme far right, uh, and two, um, now we have a more challenging economic scenario for any left-wing government with the current stage of the, the industrialization and all the changes in the global scenario and the end of the commodity cycle, and this has a big hole um, on all these uh, possibilities to the new pink tide or not. And third, the intensification of, uh, of fights and rivalries between powers in the international arena. And the last, the last one is the challenges faced by Latin American regionalism that also retreat a lot in the last decade. And in my very short intervention, I would like to highlight the first one, so the rise on the far right organization and the challenges for the left, calling attention to what we are living in Brazil right now and hoping that this helps us to shed light also to the differences with, from the Brazilian moment and I don't know, maybe the Colombian and the Chilean uh, realities that to me are the most, I don't know, progressive or the, mo the most close, the, the closest of this new pink tide circle. So, uh, what I, I, would, I would say is that what Brazil has been facing in political economic terms and what we saw last Sunday in the electoral results denies any possibility of calling the current juncture in the country and an eventual Lula government as part of the new pink tide. Uh, as a Brazilian uh, position in the former progressive cycle was dec decisive, I think this put in question the consideration of a new pink tide for the whole region. So we were and we are still all shocked with the election results. So for those that are not into the what's happening here, um, Lula won the first 
the first round by a difference of only 5% of votes, which mean um, around 6 million votes uh, ahead Bolsonaro, right? Which is it's really, really like a, a very a tight, um, a very tight run running for the presidency. And we have this year 20% uh, of abstentions in the election. So it's the highest level of abstentions in 20 years. In Brazil, the vote is mandatory, and which means many people choose do not go there and vote, do not choose uh, an alternative uh, facing Bolsonaro, right? So, and, and Regard, like considering the, the other uh, candidates, uh, Bolsonaro and Lula will basically be disputing around 10 million votes uh, this month until October 30, the next, uh, the second round of the elections. But what shocked like most parts of the left and I think the whole country is the fact that almost all Bolsonaro ex-ministers uh, were elected for the Senate or the lower house in the Congress with a really shocking um, vantage uh, regarding the left and, and the center uh, candidates. So this, I think this shows how Bolsonarism and Bolsonaro have, has been um, reaffirming itself as a very uh, strong and conservative, um, strong and social cultural power, you know, not, not only a power, but um, a phenomenon that it, it's not temporary. It's not something that will go away very fa uh, fast or soon or easily, but a more rooted uh, social cultural phenomenon that it's linked with uh, all the Latin American and specifically with the Brazil, Brazilian history, you know? Like if we look to the current scenario after a pandemic that killed like more than 700,000 uh, um, people, we have the, the Minister of Health, the ex-Minister of Health of Bolsonaro being elected uh, the second more well-voted uh, congressman for, for, from Rio. And we have like people as Ricardo Salles, that it was the ex-environment minister uh, being elected uh, with three times more votes than Marina Silva, that was the former uh, candidate to presidency, an uh, environmental activist, uh, being elected uh, in, this, in this situation. And we have the Maris Alves, former ministers of family, women and human rights, elected for the Senate with 45% of votes in Brasilia, that is the capital. So nobody was expecting this, neither them, neither the far, the far right, you know, like all the forecasts were saying the opposite. All the political analysis were saying the opposite or were saying like that maybe those people would be elected but never with this level of uh, vantage, you know? So uh, this show us something and we need to learn uh, with this, this first round of the elections and trying to understand this uh, far right reemergency phenomena as something that maybe uh, it's, it's not, not only more rooted as I already said, but something that uh, really shows the direction we are going into, you know? So um, I would also, sorry, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, watching my time, so if oh, you're fine, could... you're fine. Okay, just let me know. So I would say that um, all this shows that Bolsonaro can canalize deeply racist and sexist conservancies forged by 350 years of slavery, decades of two anti-communist Christian and very nationalistic dictatorships, and a daily afterlife of that past where those practices are uh, reaffirmed and re-elaborated in and through institutional political policies and practices. So we need to understand that there are elements that related to the maintenance of uh, order, of public security, of uh, the idea of nation turning to avoid any kind of political alternative, what we can call a permanent counter-revolution uh, taking place. 
and elements linked to the conservation of family in Christianity to sustain a certain type of social reproduction pattern that enables super exploitation of labor and the maintenance of a higher level of expropriation and dependency that are still hegemonic in Brazilian civil society and present in pre present with a lot of force in workers' sub subjectivity and daily lives, which is why Bolsonaro went to the second round and why many figures supported by him were elected to the Congress. So Bolsonaro always represents uh, a simple answer to problems that are complex. And he gives cohesion to Brazilian conservatism by saying that intellectuals, that university elite and the press actually make things difficult and actually like um, represents a barrier to the development, uh, a barrier to the, uh, the greatest future that Brazil can have as a leadership in the region. And uh, they get in the way in, in order to drive Brazil to a so-called communist way that could risk all these elements I've just mentioned. So the fact that Brazil is transitioning also from a uh, Catholic to an evangelical neo-Pentecostal country, also a very neoliber neoliberal phenomenon plays an important role in religious funda fundamentalism for the first time serves as an important popular fortress for the organization and solidification of the far right. So this is also a new uh, phenomenon that was not present in, in, the, in the first cycle of the pink tide. And now it's very, very strong here. And I guess it's, it's getting stronger in the, the whole continent. So uh, all these points and, and comes to, to dialogue with the weaknesses in Lula's campaign and in Lula's political economic project, um, because uh, all, all this and, and the necessity of maintaining the same uh, social reproduction pattern, it's, a, it's also pre present in, in his campaign and his political project. So uh, his project, it's now much more directed to reinforce neoliberalism and financialization of everyday life than its former administration, mm -hmm. which, which contradictory uh, brings him to a position where he, at the same time, he needs to face Bolsonarism and Bolsonaro in this direction, but at, at the same time need, need to conserve some of these elements to maintain the same social reproduction pattern. So he has been doing it. He, he, he himself says, uh, for example, that uh, what, if, if he, he elect, he'll be elected, he would not abandon austerity as he said very rest, recently, fiscal responsibility is, is his profession of faith. And he, he has like giving the, those declarations to the press. Uh, he chose it to have Geraldo Alckmin, almost the personification of Brazilian neoliberal and bourgeois project um, as his vice president. And, his, and Geraldo Alckmin is a, a person that it's uh, even more right-wing than Dilma's vice Michel Temer that was uh, leading the coup against her in 2016. So he chooses to have with him a, a man that is the personification of this very neoliberal and bourgeois project. And he chooses to make a campaign built from top down. So focus in conversations with the, what he calls GDP winners and high bourgeois, and not the masses. So, for them, while while having these uh, private conversations with the entrepreneurship, he for the masses, he was just believing that people would naturally vote on him just because he was the best president we ever had, uh, and he keeps saying this in the TV show, uh, TV interviews, publicly speaking, that people remember that. Uh, he was the best president. People remember that at that time we had barbecues at home, you know, that people remember we uh, eat well and dress it well and etc. And not uh, actually having a mass uh, mobilization to, to get the power. So now electoral results represents a dangerous scenario for Lula. First, because it's not clear at all uh, and not at all automatic that all votes that have gone for the third way candidates will now migrate to Lula. This is not something that it's predictable and that it's like um, 
uh, uh, automatic path, despite those candidates uh, show its support to Lula, you know, because it's an electoral basis that are all uh, from center or right perspectives, and um, they are very anti the Workers' Party, and they are very anti leftist So, uh, and second, the campaign of a neo fascist as Bolsonaro never move along to the paths of the rules of the game or, the, or, or to the paths of the democratic game. So um, we need to get rid of this liberal democratic fetishism. People still sell, selling votes in Brazil a lot, still voting in a range of different coercive ways. So being, um, uh, being violent, um, violent by militias, being, uh, you know, oh, are obliged to vote by, by preachers and uh, by many conservative and very violent uh, social forces. So the institutionalist top-down reasoning that has so far dominated the leadership of the Workers' Party campaign could be a disaster in the second round. And we are not uh, you know, uh, free of this situation. So the only way to electorally defeat Bolsonaro on October 30, uh, this is, and this is the main lesson we need to take from the result of the first round. It's a mass movement on the street. So we need uh, to elect Lula and, and to show some resistance to this uh, neo fascist project. We really need um, a wave of popular support. We need a visible and expressive enough uh, demonstrations to drag in part those of th those people that abstained in the first round and to ensure the confidence of those that are threatened by the truculence of violence and now fascism to vote in Bolsonaro. So we really know, really, we really need a mass movement and to dialogue with Mariano's question here, the left has no real choice than radicalize its project right now but we're not doing this and this is scary. <laughs> so it seems we're trying to fight neoliberal fa neo fascism with progressive neoliberalism, which doesn't seem enough to our social basis uh, or to support a, a progressive government or even a progressive uh, mass movement that uh, it's capable of electing Lula in 30 days right now, you know? So uh, we're not doing this and we will need to transform the next four weeks in the most intense political and social mobilization process that Brazil ever seen in recent times. Uh, what, and this is something that the cupola or that the leadership of Lisa, the workers' really party- sorry. Don't I'm really sorry, I don't want to intervene. I actually don't want to intervene in what was really an impassioned call to arms, but I gotta just, I gotta, can we wrap up really quickly? So my time is over or I have like one minute to conclude. I, I, I gave you an extra couple minutes okay but do you want to end do you want to just okay, wrap so it up really quickly one minute go okay i can wrap up i would just say that we need this mass movement but what the leadership of the workers party don't want either because having masses back in the streets clearly will make more difficult their eventual government too so they have to face institutionally the far right in the Senate and the lower house and they go in the governor's state in the states, but at the same time, they cannot have the masses in the street press pressing for the government. So it's a situation that it's very contradictory and we are not like able to push like we as the left outside the workers party are not being able to push the masses alone, you know, to the streets in the um, scale that we need to elect Lula. So this is something that I would say, and thank you, sorry for the time. No, no, that was actually, it's a actually really wonderful point to end on that I think we'll definitely come back to. Um, okay, I'm just gonna move the spotlight to someone else. Uh, okay, our final speaker is Camilla Viagra, who is a critical legal theorist, historian and journalist from Chile, writing on the relation between inequality, corruption, domination, and how to inst institutionally empower common people to resist oppression from the powerful few. That is quite a research project. Um, currently, she is um, a fellow at the University of Cambridge and she's conducting research on pleb 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 plebeian constitutional rights. Camilla, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to reflect on the current conjuncture uh, in Latin America. Uh, to answer very quickly to the question, is this a second pink tide? I would say uh, no. <laughs> this is my short answer. Um, and I want to first uh, refer to four patterns uh, that are a, a, that are in the region uh, and then uh, go into Chile and see how these patterns uh, play out. So uh, first, um, uh, just want to say that this conjuncture that we're living now resembles uh, the beginning of the 20th century in which there was a rise of the far right on the one hand, you have a revolutionary radical left in the streets, and then you have this social democratic amoeba <laughs> in, in the center, uh, which basically abandons the um, left-wing principles and embraces a capitalism and credit for all things as a, as a way of emancipation or you know, accommodation and a adaptation to the system, okay? So I think we are living kind of in the same scenario today, um, but with some differences that are also crucial. So the first pattern that we are seeing is the role of media and uh, the proliferation of fake news and misinformation and ignorance. This is structural ignorance that has been kind of built into the system since the uh, neoliberal reforms in the 80s. Uh, people, the um, education systems have been defunded. Uh, the um, traditional media have been co-opted by oligarchic interest. And there, there is diversity within these oligarchic interests, but they're all from one kind of side of the spectrum, which is capital. Um, and this, they have really mastered the, uh, the fake news and misinformation uh, model, I would say. And this, I am going to dwell a little bit on Chile afterwards and, and how this played out. Then we have the rise of ethno-nationalist politics, what we call neo-fascist politics. And of course, this is not only in Latin America, it's also in Europe, in the US, right? We have Trump in the United States. Now uh, we have uh, the uh, Tory government turned neo-fascist or neo-oligarchic uh, in the UK. Uh, and also now the, uh, the recent uh, election in Italy um, with the uh, neo-fascist um, uh, candidate, uh, Giorgia Milani, uh, who, um, who basically won an absolute majority in Italy. And she is uh, an heir to Mussolini's um, a movement. Uh, so these ethno-nationalist politics, um, first of all, dwell, they, they are based on family values. So a rejection of uh, the diversity in, the, in society and the um, embrace of a patriarchy. Um, the, they're anti-feminist. And they are uh, the abortion uh, topic is one that is being deployed, and we have seen this in the United States and also in in the rest of the Americas. Uh, they also embrace patriotism and the uh, and the push against immigrants as a as a, um, uh, a threat to the purity of the body politic. You know this uh, the the of the people either Brazil or Chile or wherever the idea of contamination is uh, very pervasive and the taking away of you know the basic things that people have so pitting the working classes against each other uh, competing for the for the crumbs that the system gives. Uh, there is also uh, the uh, disciplining of labor by uh, deep, by privatization of social services. Uh, and, and this is all playing out uh, in uh, as, a, as, a, as a rhetoric against globalization. Yeah? And this is not new, but this is kind of coming to Latin America in this kind of second wave um, that started more in the North. Uh, the third pattern is the, um, the um, uh, increasing control of the transnational oligarchy. And here, um, as a um, as other, the other speakers were saying, uh, there the IMF uh, uh, and all the kind of austerity politics are back. And here are kind of a 90s reloaded uh, in the sense that they are uh, this neo-populist or we can call it uh, the, the people that sell themselves as pro-people, but then when they come to office, they uh, engage in agreements with the IMF or with uh, uh, transnational corporations, with uh, international commercial agreements. Uh, so there is a neo extractivist 
a pattern going on in the region in which uh, that that uh, is also permeating the left okay and the left and i say here the left uh, uh, not really uh, uh, the neoliberal left is this something that really exists um and then finally we have uh one thing that I have been observing uh, in uh, more recent uh, times is the uh, cooptation of rhetoric and the use on, of environmentalist politics to actually embrace more transnational uh, extractivist um, uh, um, policies. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but it's how, you know, the greenwashing and how the, the, this money from the global north uh, goes into funding NGOs in Latin America that uh, say that they are environmentalists and they are prote protecting the environment, but they're, what they're really doing is um, putting a, a barrier to the nationalization of resources uh, that uh, the, this, uh, the, the first pink tide or the pink tide um, uh, 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 current in a way of governments were undergoing. Instead of nationalizing, they're really this new wave is, is, is uh, embracing privatization or really not problematizing with it, okay? So when we come to Chile, this is, uh, the pattern is, is pretty clear. We have a cycle of contention that started in 2011 with the high school students protesting against the voucher system in education, um, and the defunding of education the, itself and, and understanding that it's not about a public policy because in Chile, everything is codified in the constitution. So all the neoliberal structures were put into the constitution very difficult to change, okay? So um, this cycle of contention started in 2011 and ended in a way, or, or at least it's, uh, reached its peak in terms of a crystallization of different movements in 2019 in the uprising, uh, what we call uh, the El Estallido, which is um, the outburst, which is a very kind of a, um, a non-agency metaphor to refer to a popular uprising, uh, but it's actually the people um, who rose up and not something that burst, okay, and didn't have any direction or agency. Uh, and um, uh, this, uh, the, again, the high school students call on, uh, they were protesting the strike, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, rising of the fair of the subway, and they called for a mass civil disobedience campaign to evade the fair as another way to struggle. Okay, and they call on society to struggle and the repression coming from that uh, at the moment, the right wing government of Sebastián Piñera uh, really prompted people to go out and defend the children, basically the adolescents that were leading uh, this, re this revolution uh, that ended in failure, uh, but uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, created a mass a mobilization at the moment that was not really articulated. It was not something that was in a party, but it was a movement against the party system. At the moment of, of that October 2019, uh, the political class had an approval rating of 96, of, of a disapproval rating of 96%. So basically their approval rating was within the margin of error. Okay, so the Congress, all the institutions were on the floor in terms of approval, but especially the political class was rejected by all. OK, so this political class ended up co-opting this constituent process from below in which the people were um, uh, demanding a new constitution, a new structure for a new society that would leave neoliberalism behind. And this political class, which was Ill illegitimate at the time, um, it led a process that they didn't want to lead, that they didn't want it to happen. So we have one of the first constituent processes that was against the grain and said against power. There were no, as the first pink tide, uh, the presidents leading this, this process by um, uh, being elected on a platform from changing the constitution, then um, in, uh, fostering a plebiscite, and then kind of uh, creating the environment for the, the, the assemblies to uh, create new, a, a new constitution. This didn't happen in Chile. It was a right-wing president that didn't want the process to go on, and the political class uh, made a pact to save themselves and to control the process, to basically limit the constituent power from below and to exclude the people from the process. So the people wanted to participate, didn't want the political parties, they want to engage themselves in politics and uh, basically the political class monopolized the process and uh, excluded uh, the people from it. Within this process in December, uh, 
2021, last year, uh, the, uh, the new, uh, the, uh, at the end of last year, November, December, there were the elections in Chile. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the runoff was, and it's a very similar uh, kind of uh, a, a, a structure of the, of the elections in terms, in, at least in Brazil or in other uh, places where, where we have runoff, that we have this kind of a neo-fascist, openly neo-fascist, uh, Bolsonaro friend, you know, uh, Jose Antonio Cast, uh, that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that, uh, that run against uh, Gabriel Boric, who was part of the new left, you know, the, 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 the uh, um, student leader from, you know, the federations, which were not the ones protesting in the street and jumping the turnstiles, but it was the one that if from the, 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 the leadership of, of the students, which we know, you know, they're not really progressive at the end of the day. They're very kind of part, they, they want them in, in the part in the system. So uh, he ran against this neo-fascist leader and the runoff was really incredible in terms of like how the message was sold. He is part of, you know, a very conservative, moderate left, if you will, that they didn't want nothing to change. They just want to make things better in a way. They wanted to reform. Uh, but they, he sold himself as a kind of an Antifa person. Uh, they were saying, oh, it is us or, you know, the fascists. So therefore, we are the answer. And there was this weird, you know, um, it, a, a kind of a, a concept in which there was this neoliberal embrace that we need to really protect the system, but we need to fight, you know, fascism. Uh, and, and this is really something that um, it didn't, it was a, a lot of noise for the people that, uh, of us that had been studying, you know, historic fascism and how uh, the things play out. So he won with 55.8% you know, of the vote. However, uh, he really, uh, he got, you know, uh, and I have read out, uh, written about this, he was, he was elected on borrowed votes and on, on votes that were not his, that were basically votes against the fascist, okay? So he knows that his leg legitimacy is very precarious, okay? So uh, he, he, he comes to power and uh, he immediately um, it starts uh, traveling to Canada, where Canada is the, 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 um, the country that has the most uh, investment in Chile in copper, for example. They're the, the owners of the majority of copper mines. So immediately he goes and he embraced Trudeau and they had a, a beer like buddies in the bar, you know, and they really became best buds. And he basically went to offer 30 more uh, extractivist projects to Canada, okay? The same happens with uh, the, uh, the um, green hydrogen, which was started by Piñera, uh, that is a, 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 an agreement with Rotterdam. So again, the same um, that was said before, the idea is that this new kind of social democratic governments are really engaging in a new extractivist form of uh, production that is there for um, a, a helping the transition to a green new world in the north. So um, we are talking about um, tons and tons of uh, drinking water being uh, needed to be purified first with energy, then producing through hydrogen and then shipped to Europe. Okay, so this is the neo extractivist and this is has been embraced and with this I finish and in addition uh, is the uh, the the um the embrace of the TPP-11, this uh, trade agreement which gives new rights to corporations to sue the governments if the governments engage in uh, uh, new regulations that uh, uh, dampen their profits in the future, okay? So in a neoliberal country like Chile in which everything is private, so for you to know, uh, 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 copper was nationalized in 1970, in 1970 uh, so 100% of the copper was from Chile, now 70% of copper mining is in transnational hands. So when we talk about changing the regulatory structure, uh, if we change that, it means that Chile would need to compensate all the, the uh, mining companies for the changing of the structure and for nationalizing their own industry. So if we think about the parallel of uh, abolishing slavery in the United States, in which the state paid the slaveholders uh, because it was uh, basically expropriating their wealth by liberating the slaves. The same is happening now. We are the neoliberal left, 
you know, this is a social democrat that doesn't believe in the welfare state, uh, um, is pacting with, you know, the, uh, the Canada and Australia and other uh, countries that are the mining uh, leaders in Chile to, uh, to give them rights uh, to their corporations uh, in order to be compensated and for Chile to be kind of frozen in its model of development because it would be too expensive to move away. Uh, and uh, the example of water, water is private in Chile and corporations need water, for example, a copper mining to do their, their extraction. So they need water, so they buy liters per second at 20, 30 years. So if we um, nationalize water and, and uh, enshrine it as, a, as a, um, a human right, then we will have to pay the corporations uh, for our own water. And this is basically where we're at. And this is what is happening right now. And the president who has the monopoly over foreign policy has says that uh, he will accept anything that will be voted in the Senate, which is controlled by the right wing coalition. So if the right wing coalition says yes to the TPP 11, he will just, you know, ratify it and sign it. And this is basically, again, uh, as has been said before, if the right wing government is the one who embraces a transnational oligarchy uh, that is backing corporations that um, is privatizing and that is uh, embracing the fiscal uh, responsibility, which is also a phrase uh, of Boric, uh, this austerity, there, there, therefore we cannot call them properly, property, uh, properly uh, uh, left wing party or a uh, candidate. So we need to really uh, 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 dispel this idea that because they call themselves social democrats or because they so call themselves as left, we need to call them left and we need to accept that. That is unacceptable from my perspective. Um, and um, and with that, I, I, I close and I, I, I hope we can have a, a, a further discussion. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Camilla. Um, yeah. Do we, what, how do we dob a social democrat? That in itself is a very big question. Um, OK, this is brilliant. We have questions in the chat, but as normal, we prefer people who would like to either turn the camera on or put the audio on and ask a question. Um, would anyone want like to kick us off? If not, I can read some of these questions in the chair. Yeah. Okay. As someone, as people get the courage to speak, I'll read a couple of these out. So we have a question to Mariano from <coughs> Kieran. Kieran, do you want to do you want to ask this yourself? If you're still here. Well, I mean, there's not much I can say in addition to the question, really. I, I'm fairly ignorant as to what's going on in Argentina uh, amongst the working class, because that seems to me to be uh, the source of power, isn't it? People fighting back uh, on the streets and taking strike action. So I just really was, was interested in hearing from Mariano uh, what, what's happening uh, with the levels of working class struggle uh, in Argentina. Thank you. Okay. Let me, let's see if I can get someone else to say hello to us. <laughs> Mario, would you like to ask your question or do you want me to do it? Yes, I, I can, I can. It was simply, you know, the, the usual sense of the left wing in Latin America is sometimes unfair to some of the republics which seems to have not had the chance of being revolutionary or something like that, and and you know, in my own in my own research in Colombia, I have I have a lot of patience for a process which was, first of all, the longest uh, violent, I will call it the civil war, for many years. In that suddenly, whoever comes with this agreement, uh, whatever percentages are, is expected to have solved everything. And therefore, that's why my question was to Catalina, do you think that Colombia, which in many ways, the church, economics, um, the oil and many others, is an exception to movements of left wing of the 1970s. So you have, you have Camilo Torres, you know, 1964, and then you have everybody trying to get at things. And then Petro comes as a president and two to four years later, he needs to have solved everything. I have lots of patience for him. I know him personally. So I'm not saying he, 
he should not go more left. But sometimes Colombia is a bit out than socialist republics, you know, Chile 1970, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, etc. Uh, and then Argentina had it, Brazil had it, and then suddenly Colombia is expected to have solved everything while they're just coming into this game of left leftism. Thank you. Cool, thank you. I'm going to try and get a question for each speaker so that we have like a... I think I've got three, so... I'll, I know, so I'll, I think we'll just... Go for them. Oh, we'll come back to them. We'll come back to them. Don't worry, I've got them noted down here. Uh, for Risa, we had, there was a question on Brazil from Sam Pryke, who I think has gone. Uh, and the, the question was, in some reporting on the Brazilian election, the evangelical churches are said to command up to 30% of the electorate who nearly all vote for, for Bolsonaro, the right, regardless of class and ethnicity. Is this the case? Similar developments, are there similar developments elsewhere in Latin America? So that's about the role of the evangelical church in Brazilian politics. And then Camilla, I'm hoping there's a question for you down here. If not, I have one. <laughs> there isn't one. Why don't we take one of these more generally one, general ones then, Camilla, you could do that. And then I'll, I'll I can, in the next round, I can ask you a direct question. Um, you can also answer the evangelical one in Chile yeah? because also, Brilliant. yes. Yes, feel free to drag this across to your context and vice versa. And if you have questions for each other on the panel, please go ahead with that. But if we just go with this last one from Neil Coleman. Neil, do you want to read this out? Do you want me to do it? I think it's better if Neil summarizes it. <laughs> <laughs> if he's here. Is Neil known to us? No? Okay, we'll come I, back to that question. I'll I take am, it. yeah. Oh, he's here. Sorry, I'm, I'm on my back with a bad back at the moment. But uh, which question did you want me to? <laughs> I, I raised a few issues there. Well, I think if you could just dissect it into a succinct part in, in the comment that you left. Yeah, look, it's, it's really about what is, uh, you know, let's not call it the pink tide. What, what is the progressive shift in Latin America mean for the global, both for the global south and for the international uh, situation currently? Uh, and there's a danger in my view that, you know, we as left-wing analysts, you know, always tend to be quite, uh, you know, correctly to raise the critiques, to raise the contradictions, uh, to identify, um, you know, all the areas where these movements are going off track. Um, and the question really is, in the, in the context of this contested terrain uh, and this global international crisis, for us in, in Africa, yeah, you know, I, I'm based in South Africa, I'm an activist in South Africa, you know, the, 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 the Latin American progressive shift represents the only um, hope for humanity uh, at this particular point in time. I mean, if we look at this desperate international situation, where does a progressive potential really reside? And it's Latin America at this point with all its contradictions and problems. So the questions I was posing was, yes, you know, critique, identify the problems, the contradictions from Brazil to, to Chile as, as people have done, but uh, what are the possibilities? You know, let's not look at the limitations only. Let's look at the possibilities. You know, the the uh, the Gramskian saying, you know, pessimism of an intellect, optim optimism of the will. So, so you know, what are those possibilities in terms of the regional? Um, you know, we we had seen Alba and, and and various other attempts in the in Latin America in the in, in the previous so-called Pink Tide attempts to develop. Uh, ideas of, you know, alternative industrialization programs, uh, attempts to nationalize national resources in Bolivia, uh, in, 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 in other countries, an alternative financial architecture, uh, the role of Latin America in global uh, multilateral institutions in the, in the United Nations. As I mentioned in one of my questions, uh, I was part of a trade union delegation at the International Labour Organization a number of years ago, 
And the fact that you had progressive Latin American governments present there completely altered the balance of forces on particular debates in the international labor organization. So, you know, on the current, on the big challenges in the world today, or, you know, on the nuclear threat, on, on, on uh, you know, questions of, of, of military confrontation, on a whole host of questions, you know, in the World Trade Organization or, uh, in, you know, in various other institutions, not saying that these are left socialist governments, but their progressive orientation can make a really significant difference. So I'd like to hear the speakers reflect on this uh, while not asking them to, you know, whitewash or to paint too glowing a picture, but actually to, to identify where within these limitations and these contradictions, progressive movement forward is possible. That was a sort of sense of what I was trying to pose in my questions. Thank you. Cool, brilliant. Um, that, yeah, where's the hope? I think we can summarize that as. Um, Catalina, did you have a question? Yes. Yeah? No? no. Okay. Alex, do you want to ask your question? Okay. Um, first, first, thank you very much for four really great and informative and sometimes in, inspiring presentations. Secondly, I mean, I think that, um, I, th I think that it's quite a difficult, it, this seems to me a, di a discussion where it's quite hard to generalize because this has already been said, we're talking about um, um, different countries moving according to very different political time scales. You know, compare Brazil, where Lula is standing for the presidency for a second term in office as leader, leading figure of the Workers' Party, with Colombia, where, as, as we've heard, it's at the end, you know, we're talking about a political process that takes place at the uh, uh, within the framework of the resolution of a very long, long civil war. So it's it's quite hard to generalize across these these cases. Um, I but <coughs> nevertheless, <coughs> one factor that seems to me that is true of many countries is the uh, the fact that to the extent there are advances of the left, they're being challenged by an extremely aggressive. Uh, and reactionary right. I mean, most obviously in the case of Brazil, but it seems to be true much more, much more generally. So I'd like to ask, what, to what extent is this new right, is this right new? To what extent um, does, it, does it represent political innovation in the uh, Latin American context? To what extent, however, is it a continuation of very long-standing um, um, uh, reactionary is deeply embedded in these societies? Um, what people think. Think about the balance in and, and innovation. Thank you. Brilliant. I'm just going to turn my camera off because my uh, my feed is not so great. I'm I'm conscious that actually only men have asked questions. So, um, uh, Bridget, is that? Can you can you go ahead? <laughs> um, yes, I was. Um, I was. I. I, I didn't hear the Argentina uh, contribution, so I only heard the, heard the last three. But it, uh, it seems that uh, all these uh, uh, left-wing governments uh, are, are nevertheless believing in the inevitability of continuing uh, uh, extractivism. So go for it. And, uh, and 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 I think the the sufferings that uh, that come with uh, massive mining and uh, mining of uh, 
of forests, of, uh, of uh, gold mines, of uh, petrol, and, uh, and you, uh, you name it for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the population is, uh, 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 is, uh, is enormous. At least I, I can see that in the country I know well, which is, uh, which is Nicaragua and, and there, actually people start to to mobilize uh, uh, against that and it may be also one of the reasons not just let's say uh, class struggle and labor struggle but also the struggle against extractivism that brought these left-wing uh, politicians uh, to power and are they now uh, definitely betraying their uh, this part of their electorate I like that question. Sure, sharp, amazing. Um, okay, so we try and get some answers. I don't know who would like to go first, but we could. Yeah. Can I go first? Go for it. Okay. So uh, the time, John. Can you? <laughs> you if if I say two minutes and then I'll start waving like that. Yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So <I'll> try. <laughs> and. Yeah, I, thank you for the questions. I think Neil bring a very important point that I didn't have time to comment in my in my intervention. That is uh, these victories, right? Like, uh, uh, like it's undeniable that in the in these elections in Brazil we also have uh, victors, but the victors are uh, like in the same stand of our minority. You know what I mean? Like we are minority has left, and the victors were like huge if we compare to the Brazilian history. So the first time we have a trans woman in the Congress, in the Federal Congress, for the first time two indigenous women, uh, yeah, two, I, sorry, it was two trans women and two indigenous women uh, elected. And uh, uh, Guilherme Boulos, which is a leader uh, of the, the left, uh, of the um, homeless movement and the landless movement has representations and et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, is in the same, at the same time we, we get this, those positions, the contradictions rise and the, the, the new right and the far right are um, targeting the same, uh, unto, like they are electing more women as anti-feminist women to the Congress. They are electing more black people that are declaring themselves black people in the anti-black agenda. So we had like, they elected much more than we elected. So th this is the, the main difficulty here. So of course it's undeniable in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, we advanced a lot as a left in, in terms of political debate, in terms of how socialists understand uh, the people, the Brazilian people, how to organize, how to talk about race, class, gender, as a, an, you know, in a unitary way and et cetera. And I, I used to say that we advanced 50 years in five, you know, like in those debates. We are like really, really advanced um, after the first pink tide, but now, like we have, we we are facing this um, new scenario that is capturing the all the uh, debate for the right side. So uh, the other question asks me if the evangelical uh, people uh, it's the same proportion, it's thirty percent, etc. Yeah, it's true. Brazil is becoming an evangelical country for the first time in history, and this changes a lot of things. Like um, I, I am from a, a, a Afro-Brazilian religion that is a minority a religion community, uh, very linked to the black movement, very linked to the women black black women's movement history. And uh, it's crazy hearing you. Sometimes I feel I'm living in Gilead. You know, you go to a public hospital, and it's good morning, God bless you. Like good morning, <laughs> you know, like this. This is it's something that ten years ago was not like that, you know. And we we had in Brazil, um, of course, the Catholic Church has a very conservative forces force for long for for many decades. But the left was used to deal with Catholic uh, Church, and also the left uh, was born in, in many Catholic um, grassroots movements. So we had. Uh, a, a part of the left that that co come from 
uh, Catholicism and, and builds with uh, mass movements with people and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. This new uh, evangelical scenario is totally different. We don't have this uh, uh, grassroots organizing. We need to build, to build it, but we need to understand how to build it. It's a different uh, philosophy. It's a different, very linked to neoliberalism, individualistic, all this stuff. So it's it's so Kalinikos asked if we are living like if it's if the new far it's right is really new right so yeah I, I would say of course we we always deal with this is a country that it was living in slavery a hundred years ago so of course it's not new but it's new in the sense that uh it shows itself in new forms in new ways and put us new challenges that the left can, it's not being very successful in facing it at the same extent, I would say this, and we need to face this. And I think Lula is a barrier to this, you know, so we can advance because he's it's kind of, you know, retain the powerful and, uh, and the, the mass movements in this sense of advancing something. But that's it, but the time is over for sure. No, brilliant. And I think this links up with what's happening in the other context. Um, what, what I'm going to do is, Camilla, can you go next? And then we'll have Catalina, then we'll have Mariano just quickly responding, and then I'm going to try and get some more questions in. So be as brief and succinct as possible. Yes, I will. So first on the evangelical question, I think we need to remember that this evangelical movement and the alliance with the far right is actually orchestrated from above. So in the United States, the Koch brothers uh, funded the Tea Party movement, and that's how, you know, the Trumpist uh, uh, forces came to power. And in Chile, the uh, neo-fascist Jose Antonio Cast went to, uh, to the U.S., met with the, with the movement of Alan Sears, and uh, they basically uh, passed the same protocol that you need to get your alliance with the, with the evangelicals. And he went back to Chile and he funded, he founded the Republican Party uh, that is in alliance with the uh, evangelical right. So uh, this is something that is repeating, it's a pattern everywhere, and it's something that is funded. It's not something that is happening, that people are just converting. There are more funding of churches everywhere uh, from the ground up, and this is a very dangerous uh, thing that we need to take into account. Then in terms of this neoliberal left and, 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 and the opportunities, uh, one thing that I need to point out is that when we have a neoliberal left governments uh, in, in power, this uh, pseudo uh, social Democrats, the problem is that there's no opposition. If they want to privatize, if they want to be fiscally responsible, if they want to do whatever conservative politics, there's no opposition. And this is terrible. This is how in the United States, you know, Obama was one of the worst presidents in that regard because uh, all of that, the, the conservative politics were, were passed with a, uh, in a breeze in a way. So nobody was opposing them. So this is something we need to take account. And in terms of uh, the opening of possibilities, because when we have an institutional crisis and we have these leaders that come to power and sell, you know, smoke in the sense of sell something that they are not going to deliver on, and then uh, uh, the, the people get this illusion, then there's an opportunity because we need to pass beyond the representative politics. Representative politics has been from the beginning a form of oligarchic politics. People are excluded from power. People are ignorant. They cannot really engage in politics. Politics cannot be outsourced, if you will. So therefore, this opens an opportunity. This institutional crisis opens an opportunity for organizing from below. And here I call to embrace uh, the theory of Lux Rosa Luxemburg and this double strategy in which we need an instrumental party but we need the organization from below. Without the organizing and uh, the social movements that are articulated, not only nationally, but also across borders, there's very little that we can do. We cannot put our trust in a leader, in a leader that is already limited by the model. We need to really start from scratch in a way from the ground up and in order to keep our uh, few leaders that are good, honest, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think there is the, the opportunity for a global alliance uh, of a social movements that are fighting transnational capital. And, and here, one quick example of the defenders of water. In Mexico, in, in Chile, there are communities that are fighting against the uh, transnational corporations that are basically uh, bottling all the, all the water and bringing it to Europe. 
okay, or selling Coca-Cola. So they are rising up and there's an opportunity for the people to get articulated and to actually push the transnationals away and not from one side to the other. That is what is happening, that people defend their locality and then they cannot transcend that. So I think it is an opportunity uh, when this system, uh, oligarchic system is really degrading that something new can come in, into, a play, into play. And, 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 um, and the balance between the old and the new, yes, we cannot go against uh, uh, the system in a way as it is played. Uh, we cannot just uh, push for, you know, uh, um, raising it to the ground. We need to really kind of uh, rework the system from within because the system has its own legitimacy and uh, building, we need to build a, stru a structure that is outside, but can be connected in a way to the system itself and not a gay, a go back into the old patterns of uh, entrusting our uh, well-being and our decisions to uh, leaders that are already in the political system and they're already constrained and they already have their agreements on the other side and want everything to remain the same uh, in order for the status quo to go on. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, Catalina? Okay. Uh, on the first question, um, the first time Lev has a chance in Colombian institutions, uh, maybe in the presidency, but we have a history of uh, at least four mayors in Bogota that have come from the democratic poll, which is a left-wing party. So there is a history kind of there in a tradition there that perhaps makes it easier for Bogota to imagine a left-wing um, you know, alternative in the executive uh, than might be the case of other regions in Colombia. Now, why somebody like Petro is not kind of more left uh, uh, far, far, far on the left, there's, there's a history, I think, in Colombia that it, that um, might be able to explain that. First, first thing is um, that, that our Indian region is the one that is that more strongly has the turnout of votes and tend to be uh, center right. We've we've had the first decade of the 21st century was a decade fundamentally of right wing politics led by what we call Uribismo, uh, comes from ex-president Alvaro Uribe Vélez. So you had a government, eight years of government from 2002 to 2010, and a very important influence of that party up to 2015-16, where and, and leading to the elections of 2020, 2018, sorry, 2018, that take Ivan Duque to the presidency. Really, that alternative has been uh, going weaker um, after Ivan Duque takes to, to, to power. Uh, but what happens really in the first decade of, of the century is a backlash against negotiation, which rides the wave on a, on a war on terror. Uh, don't forget the guerrillas are, are, are deeply unpopular in Colombia and, has, and, and that has to do with the degradation of, of the conflict. There is a social debt that left-wing guerrillas have towards, you know, not only middle class or, or high classes, but also poor uh, populations against due to the dynamics of the conflict. And most and, and experience, although urban sectors in Colombia haven't really or have 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 of course will have ties with rural areas, uh, but not necessarily would have had experienced the conflict in the same way that rural areas have. Their experience of the left uh, comes from knowing about uh, the armed left and come from knowing about Hugo Chavez and the wave of migration. I'm telling you about 1.8 million, right? Migrants from Venezuela coming to Colombia and the, and the economic stress and the social stress that that also causes. So really, I mean, uh, I think Colombia is still in, 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 in society in Colombia needs to develop an understanding of the left as a political uh, administrative that covers a national territory, which is why this, this voting is so landmark. Uh, Petro wasn't elected by the urban centers apart from Bogota, and certainly wasn't elected by um, the Andean area, it was elected by the racial periphery. And I think this is, this is very important to, to take in mind. Second question on the agreement of Escazú. So Escazú is an environmental agreement for those who are not uh, familiar with it. Uh, yes, it passed in the Senate. Uh, it has to pass in the House of Representatives before it goes to presidential sanction. Uh, the importance, the significance of it, I think, is that it sends um, a, a, a signs 
institutional commitment with the protection of environmentalists and with uh, the support of communities previous to any um, um, kind of economic uh, project. What follows from that really is a, a interinstitutional coordination with the executive to see how can that be implemented, uh, but also a dialogue with civil society organizations and, and social stakeholders, that's, that's what follows. But political will sends definitely a message, uh, although very in mind that violence uh, comes from you know, a wide variety of sectors that are not interested in protecting the environment. So you need to kind of bear that in mind. Now, uh, what is, in, in to what extent the, the, the right is new or, or what might be their longing? Yes, I think a, a lot of it is the continuation of longest standing forces in Colombia. What the plebiscite shows, though, is a, a, a consolidation of uh, the Christian rights and evangelical uh, churches uh, in terms of the political power uh, in alliance with uh, the right. The, the power of campaigning, and I always like to think about they too crunchy and they are spitting it back to us. <laughs> uh, they understand, I think since the 60s, the you know, intellectuals on the right in France understood it. And I think campaigners on the right understand it very well. Uh, the, the power of culture and the power of hegemony and how you conquer meme by meme. So I think the right understands very well the power of social media, uh, but also the power of, of the streets. And in Colombia, since the plebiscite you have civil, what they call civil resistance campaigns, either to deny it or suffocate, you know, the peace agreement and the possibility of inclusion that comes with that, but also suffocate possibilities for the new government. Brilliant. Thank you, Catalina. Thank Mariana, you. would you like to round up and then I'll try and get another couple of questions in before we end. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the question by Kieran uh, about on the working class struggle in Argentina, I, I think, uh, well, in the last few weeks, there has been, there have been many mobiliz social mobilizations. The Coordinadora for Social Change has been camping in front of the Ministry of Social Policies for many days in, in, during the last few weeks, trying to get the government to expand social policies. And during these last few months, there has been a very big uh, struggle in the tire industry where workers uh, at the Sudna, which is a union, the union there, uh, have been struggling against uh, the companies of Pirelli, Bridgestone, uh, Fate, these tire companies, to get a, a wage uh, increases. And they have won after many months and with the opposition of the, the media, with the opposition of the enterprises, and with the opposition of the Ministry of Labor, they won a, a wage hike over the inflation rate, which is, as I said, it is very big. It's been the, I think, the most important, uh, what, uh, yeah, triumph of the working class in the last few years in terms of, it, at least in this, in terms of uh, wages. And there's at, at the moment there are many schools being occupied by students in the capital city of Buenos Aires, claiming for improvements in the conditions where they study. There are many social movements and ecological movements struggling against extractivism in different ways. There are massive mobilizations everywhere around these issues. But of course, the, the, the question is whether all of this can be articulated in a social and um, political force that can uh, counter the, the hegemony of these two sides of these uh, of the parties of order, as we might call them, the conservative government, the conservative uh, alliances, and the so-called uh, national popular alliance. I think this is the, the question at, at the moment. How can we? Uh, create a, a more powerful force there uh, to at least to, to stop the, these uh, two, two alliances from advancing in this uh, hegemonic consensus. I think that's, that's the question we have to, to address. And regarding the question of the, the good part of the good side of progressive governments, of so-called left-wing governments of today, I think the, the problem is that these governments are are not helping the, to build up a political force that can eventually move this, move society and move uh, transformations to the left. Uh, to the left, I think what they are doing is uh, like um, distressing people 
people are like demo, being demoralized by the the, the, the proposal that these uh, progressive governments make and don't fulfill. And this is, I think, the biggest problem because the the, the rise of the right wing movement is not just a question of their own success in terms of how to they how they can uh, talk to people. It's also the this the failure of progressive movements and left wing movements to uh, being able to uh, actually propose things and be, make them uh, doing them when they are in government. I think this is the question. If Lula wins and he doesn't deliver a progressive, uh, um, a progressive policies, it, that's not going to help uh, the left wing. Or it's not going to help the people in the medium run or even the short run. The same thing is going to happen in Chile or Colombia. I mean, we, we are hopeful that things can go uh, to, uh, to the left, but if governments do not deliver, in the medium run, this is not helpful at all. I think that's that's about what I can say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mariano. Um, all right, we've got fifteen minutes left, so I'll run the gauntlet of asking for a couple more questions. Uh, Rafila has had her hand up for a while, so would you like to go? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? No, it was it was just like to add to to the point that Haisa was making and that we've been discussing with Ian on the chat. It's what is the pride it's still about the involvement with religion, right? And uh, I come from uh, the northeast of Brazil, which is the the part where all the states uh, Lula won in all my states, right? But it's still uh, states that are heavily also co-opted by uh, evangelical uh, big churches, right? And what is it, for example, like we have like important agendas in the left, I believe that we need to move uh, forward with, but now because uh, Lula needs to win uh, you know, the second round, instead of like going for these agendas, he is um, investing time and in saying like, I too am Christian, right? Like they're like, all these cards of him, like Lula is more Christian than Bolsonaro, like literally. Bolsonaro has been divorced three times. Lula was married for 40 years, never divorced. Bolsonaro was seen engaging in masonry. Lula has never uh, dealt with any secret society, like literally people are like trying to prove that Lula is more Christian than Bolsonaro. And I think this this is a problem because, we, because it, it's like so, when he's elected, I, I think he's elected. I hope he's elected. Is this what he's going to be like held for, accounted for? Like the evangelical mega churches, the evangelical pastor saying to him, like, remember when you said you were Christian? Remember when you like that's why we voted for you. So we are still hostage, like we are being held hostage uh, in the hands of like a number of big pastors and stuff. So I understand. What Ian is saying, I do believe we need to uh, go where the working class is. The working class is on the church in the church here. Like I, both of my parents are pastors, evangelical pastors, right? It's just like, but they're uh, on the left and they spend a lot of time in church. For me, they are just, uh, in my opinion, they are wasting their time. But still, somebody has to do it, of course. But we need to do it in a way that is not like being getting our hands tied and being forever in uh, in this in this conservative like hellscape that said like we will be elected but only if you play by our rules so that we are just like giving you a crumb for you to shut up so that's that's the thing I feel like Lula could win without this uh, we have like people who voted for other candidates that are not Bolsonaro we should be trying to go for these people but I don't know why we are trying to go for the super crazy Bolsonaro fans that are now not going to vote for Bolsonaro because he's amazing. So this this is what I uh, I, I wanted to add to the, to the conversation because it's it's crazy. Yeah, for sure. They are not like I spent 15 years in church. I left because unfortunately not everybody there were like my parents and I didn't have the patience that my parents have. But yeah, so it's crazy. So that's what I wanted to contribute to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have a final question? If not, 
I'll send it back to the speakers to do like a wrap up and give us some. I, I, I just have a quick comment on this. I think uh, Rafaela also put in the chat uh, an important uh, thing about the evangelical growth in Brazil, that is they are controlling political power positions and they are controlling like a uh, privatization process. Like they are leading privatization process. They are uh, in the front of this new uh, expropriation pattern. And this is something that we cannot discount. Like it's not about who are the good Christians that we can do, we have to dialogue or not, you know? It's more institutional. And uh, I have like, I have a student in, in the Federal University in Rio de Janeiro, uh, that told me in the la last class, I, I, I am teaching gender studies and I asked the, 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 the class if they ever heard about second sex on Simone de Beauvoir. And they, 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 they raised their hands to say, well, uh, the, the only four persons in the 40 people class that ever heard this book about this book raised their hand to say, well, the preacher in my church uh, is making a study group to uh, show us that how feminists we destroy the family, how feminists destroy the world. And he is teaching us the book. So that's how we have contact with this. Like this is something that is new because like it, it was not the operation mode of the Catholic church by instance, you know, like it's another uh, way of targeting of like going direct against any kind of progressive forces. So this is something that it's in the base that we need to account of, I guess. But thank you, sorry, I'll not take the time anymore. No, no, there's, you're, all the interventions are, are needed. All right, what I'm gonna do is flip the order around of the speakers. And um, maybe we should end on the question of then of what is the future for the left in Latin America? Yeah, so Camilla would, I know it's a, I've thrown you straight in, but do you wanna go first? And yes, we'll go sure. Yes, yeah, so what is the hope for the left in Latin America? I would say that on the one hand is the, the opening of the space due to this crisis of the institutions and the uh, lack of trust in, the, in these leaders that people can start trusting themselves and understand that uh, people's powers need to be uh, wielded by people themselves. Uh, and this is a, an, a, an opening that we didn't have before when actually political parties are functional and the capital is stable, we are in a crisis and then and we have the opportunity. And on the other hand, we have the indigenous peoples as uh, kind of uh, in the front lines of the struggle against uh, extractivism and how indigenous populations have because of the uh, international law have a little bit more of capacity to actually fight them um, using the tools of the system. Uh, because they have uh, previous consultation and other uh, tools that, uh, th that uh, have been granted. Um, so therefore, uh, it, it is them who are leading the way in terms of uh, protecting the environment and fighting against capital. So I think uh, it is uh, an opportunity for uh, us as uh, leftists from Latin America, from uh, the social movement uh, base to uh, change the paradigm and not go, uh, uh, not keep going through uh, with the uh, Western paradigm of progress and developmentalism that we have, you know, embraced modernization theory and all these things that inevitably come into uh, the left. Uh, even in the first pink tide, you know, they just replace the old conservatives with the new progressives and they kept going, right? So there's no really a change uh, in terms of the uh, production matrix. Uh, we need to really think it over. And for that, I think it is crucial to, uh, to tap onto the indigenous cosmology and from that a kind of ancient understanding and relation with nature that we need to rethink the paradigm to overturn uh, the capitalist structures. Brilliant. Um, I'm trying to think who was the next person. Uh, he said, we said, I think it was you, wasn't it? Do you want to go for it? Yeah, yeah. And then when it was Catalina, then uh, Marion. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, this is a big question, right? And um, I think I, I, I fully agree with Camila. And uh, I've been myself uh, engaged on, on those process here in Brazil of uh, supporting as much as possible indigenous peoples, but also here in black community as, as a black feminist 
we have been trying to uh, gather our uh, understanding in, in, in the unit of, of nature, uh, the being, and uh, the political change that's necessary. That's why also I mentioned the African Brazilian religions because we have been in the, also with indigenous people in the um, leading the, this kind of, of alternative to capitalism. And in Brazil, we have a particular form of resistance that came from the slavery period that we call Quilombismo or we call organization in Quilombos. Uh, which would be English and Maroon community, but it, it's much more in Portuguese. I cannot define in just a few space of time, but it was uh, the only great uh, experience Brazil had of an alternative mode of production. And uh, we had this, I don't know, as a guide of how to do, you know, uh, what we have been done in these elections as black women, it, it was trying to build a common national uh, political agenda for uh, those black and women uh, that were indigenous peoples that were uh, running for any position in the elections, trying to unify uh, the political economic understanding uh, of how to make it, how to make in, the, in capitalist terms, how to make in the state, like which kind of policies we could take, uh, which kind of praxis, political praxis we could expi inspire of. And one of these uh, initiatives was the Marielle Franco Agenda, uh, which is an important guide for us, like that uh, summarizes, it's a document that it's online and it summarizes uh, what we, we have been thinking as black women for this country and um, has a lot a lot that Camila already said, you know, uh, thinking a new, um, uh, a new, a new climate um, kind of, of economic transition, you know, like that could in, encompass a, a kind of um, eco-socialism project at the same time that accounting for all the needs and, and discussions that we, we advanced in the last years regarding gender, race, and class as a unity. So um, I think that's it. I don't know the time, but that's brilliant. Uh, I can share in the chat the link of the agenda. It's in Portuguese, but- Please do. Oh. Can... And Google can translate it. Not very well, but it does, you know, most of it. Um, Catalina, go over it. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just say that um, uh, the push for peace and the push for um, progressive politics have to go in tandem in Colombia. So the willing for reconciliation and the fight for reconciliation, I think is as important as, um, you know, a, a will and a contribution to more transformative politics perhaps. And there is a challenge here to accompany a government um, in, a, in, a, in a culture that traditionally has been very skeptical of accompanying their, their governments. Uh, so that's a challenge. Okay, Catalina, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Um, I didn't cut you off, right? You finished. I finished, yeah. <laughs> it was a brilliant statement. Um, Mariano, go for it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to say that well, what we have to, what we need to do as a left-wing uh, movements is to try to articulate all of these struggles that I've been talking about here and transnationally, I would say, and uh, and look for ways to also to criticize this developmentalist alternative that progressive uh, movements and political parties are, are proposing. We we have to work on that too. Uh, we ha we have to be able to to do so. And I think something that is being done here that I think is important is that many different social movements are including in their agendas, uh, uh, the environmental agenda, uh, the workers agenda, the different agendas, the, the gender agenda, the different agendas are being uh, worked within the social movements uh, in, 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 in the different neighborhoods. And I think that's that's something important and interesting that has not, it has, has taken many years to, to happen. But nowadays, the, the possibilities of articulating these different struggles is much easier than a few years back. I think that's something that we need to work on 
in different ways and at different scales. That's it. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you all very much for your interventions. And yeah, I think I think in every region, the hopes of the left never die. They will stay around. Um, so I'd like to end with a bit of hope. And actually, we look to you guys for hope because we need it here. Um, we are back. Thank you all. Can we all thank our speakers? You can use your remote. We can't clap. You can clap. You could turn your mic on and clap if you would like. Thank you very much for a wonderful two hours. Um, what we are back actually in person on the 2nd of November. We're not doing a Zoom one next next time for Chun Lin, who is part of our organizing committee from LSE, is doing a wonderful book talk on her book, uh, Revolution and Counter Revolution in China. Um, and it's going to be in person in Kings. We will send everyone the details of, through the mailing list. Uh, and if you don't, if you're not on our mailing list, follow us on Twitter. I'm going to put the link in. I haven't got the mailing list link, but follow us there. And I'll put the mailing list link out on Twitter, just like we'll put out this video on Twitter. But again, thank you all very much. Please go and enjoy your day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, we'll be back next month. Vote yes in the UCU ballot. And yes, always vote yes in your union ballot, wherever you are and wherever your union is. Uh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It was great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, okay, so.